Hi, Diana. Hi, Nita. <laughs> nice to see you. Yes, nice so we are just um, waiting for everyone to join, but um, I'm so glad you could be with me today. Me All too. Good? Yeah. <laughs> Setting up my camera to see how far I need yeah. to the camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little different from my computer. <laughs> it is. It is. I know. And it's different when it's... Um, uh, split screen as well. Yeah. So we have Nilu who joined us. And so perhaps we can get started because um, we have a lot to go through. And um, we will, um, yeah, so we'll wait for everyone else to join as well. But so Diana, so I want to introduce you. You're Diana Chen. You're a former, former Google recruiter who became a career coach and job search expert. And that transition is really interesting, and I think that that's a place that we should start. So um, tell me about your transition into career coaching. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, hello, everyone who is here with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, so I'm Dino YK Chan. Um, I founded My Markability in 2011. So prior to that, how I got into coaching, I worked in uh, recruitment and worked in marketing and training. And throughout my entire life, I've always had a passion for helping people, always about helping people become their best, achieve their highest potential. And even through all my corporate jobs I've had, I was always the one involved with organizing lunch and learn sessions, um, teaching people how to prepare for interviews. I was always like the big sister in mentoring people for careers. So I've always had a knack for it and I was just an interest for it. And so how I got into coaching, to be honest, was because I saw a lot of people coming to me for career advice. And um, throughout my corporate career journey, I've always, in, I've enjoyed what I did, but I wasn't truly fulfilled, right? And after graduation, I was, um, I was part of a new grad program at TELUS and I rotated around. I really enjoyed it, met a lot of people. And then I moved into consulting after my MBA, um, thought that's what it was my calling because it was in HR consulting, but it wasn't quite yet. And what I realized is my true passion is really making a difference in people's lives. So that's how I got into coaching was when I was not really fulfilled, I went on a soul searching journey to really figure out um, who I am, what I want, what's truly meaningful and fulfilling for me. So fast forward where I am now as a career coach, speaker and trainer, I help mid to senior level professionals with navigating the career transition, figuring out what's next and how to differentiate as top talent to get hired faster. Right. And I have to say that your um, so you helped me after my MBA to find um, my job at that time, and I remember I had that same revelation where I liked what you did for me, and I felt that that was what I wanted to do for others. Mm -hmm. And so my whole transition into being a mindset coach, really, because you, you, <laughs> you became my mentor <laughs> through this. So. I'm so proud of you. I've always been so proud of you. How you made your transition. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And it's, it's, it, it's because of career fulfillment, like finding yeah. something that makes yeah. you yeah. feel alive, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something I've, um, I've reflected on in terms of my why, like why I even started my business. One was definitely fulfillment. It was a piece around just mm -hmm. feeling more alignment, more purposeful, more meaningful. That was like one of my number one was fulfillment. Number two was really around that freedom and flexibility. Um, I knew I wanted to have that balance as well between like kids and being a career ambitious woman as well. So that was really important to me in terms of, I guess, family flexibility and freedom was those are the other core reasons why I decided to start my own thing as well. Right, right. Very nice. So um, what I've gathered is a few scenarios with for different um, situations with moms um, and what they're going through in terms of their um, career strategy and so what I wanted to I wanted to pose those scenarios to you and see what your advice and strategies can be for them mm -hmm, so good. should we get started yeah. okay so the first one so sh we have a mom who right before quarantine was starting her quest for promotion or thinking about you know job switching jobs like kind of um, switching into um, a different role maybe something that's a little bit more um, than what she's doing currently. So anyways, so she was in that transition um, 
but the quarantine happened, lockdown happened, and she just feels right now may not be the best time. So she kind of wants to know, is job searches, are they on hold? Should she be looking? Is it too risky? And she wanted to get your opinion. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think there's a couple of things here. So first of all, the common question I always get is, is now a good time to look for a job? So I think at everyone's situation, it depends. But one thing what we do know is pre-COVID, the job market has always been competitive already. So now with, with COVID, with more layoffs happening, the job market is just more competitive. So what that translates to is that it could take longer in terms of finding something new, right? So in terms of even if you put yourself on hold, that could just mean it's going to take you longer time to find something, right? Um, what I suggest is regardless of, depending of your financial situation as well, right? If, if you need to get a job ASAP, then it's import important to find something ASAP as well, or even find something that may not be completely aligned to what you're doing now, but have that financial stability there. Now, what's really key here is to keep in mind, I think what I've been saying to double down on during this time is one is upskilling because the market is more competitive. So whether it's taking courses, becoming, having greater knowledge, that is really key. Another key piece here is really investing in your personal branding. So this means in terms of your social media presence, um, in terms of your own um, image and how you show up, the whole branding piece is so key in terms of the credibility and marketability piece. Okay? The mm -hmm. other thing to double down on is really on the networking and relationship building. Uh, because with the market so competitive, a lot of right now what I'm seeing, people are getting jobs through referrals. People who know someone mm -hmm. that's great and they're referring each other. So um, those are things that I think it's really critical to job search success. Um, I, what I see is right now we're in the summertime now. We're starting to be in the summer. And I've seen this before COVID. A lot of my clients who received like a package, they decided to take the summer off to enjoy the summer and then pick things back up in September. Um, so historically, summer months are a bit slower for hiring. Um, however, right now, the market is constantly evolving. And, you know, there's layoffs happening. And I've heard, I've talked to recruiters, people who are involved with structuring layoffs, that a lot of big companies are just happening the first round of layoffs. There's going to be more happening in the fall as well. So what this could translate to is that it's just going to get even more competitive. So the question here for those who are thinking, should I even bother? I think you need to do something regardless whether it's looking for a job or investing in your personal growth and development or really nurturing your relationships and network. Right. Okay. So there were three things, career development, um, being more competitive. So, and that, that translates into if you're laid off, like how to be more competitive yeah. and networking. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so there are more scenarios that, um, so for career development. So let's talk about the first one. Um, someone who a busy mom, She's currently at home with her kids. Um, how does she find time for career development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I totally get it. I have two young ones who are almost three and five right now. And yeah. it seems like there's a lot to juggle, like running a business and kids. And to me, it's all about, um, you know, it really forces you to figure out what your routine and schedule is and really blocking off time. And you may have, let's say, the goal to find a, let's say, a new job, right? Let's just say a new job. What you want to do is break it down into milestones. Break it, and then from there, the milestones, you break it into many tasks. So the key here is breaking into bite-sized tasks that you can tackle on a daily basis that you feel that you are making progress, right? So if you just set a goal saying, I want to find a job, that feels very overwhelming. But if you set a, t a milestone saying, my first milestone is I'm going to really get clear on what is it that I'm truly targeting, right? That's the milestone one. And then you figure out what are the tasks to get there. Milestone two could be, um, I'm gonna work on getting my resume um, up to date. That's milestone two. And then milestone three could be the LinkedIn profile. And then the milestone four is really creating your job search plan. So when you make it into bite sized, it's a lot more achievable uh, that way. And like for those who have like young ones, like, you know, if you're like little young ones, I guess like toddler age, you know, you can put in the calendar like when they're like napping, for example, that's when you're going to work on that particular uh, project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, so that's, that's for the a job search as well as career development, like whatever it is that yeah. they're yeah, planning yeah. on doing. Yeah, it could be, even if it's not job search, for example, like I'm just thinking, what would be a goal, what would be a goal that someone has on career development? Let's say improving self-confidence. 
Yeah. I, yeah. That could be one. Like I have a lot of clients I work with. Um, that's one of their big um, things to tackle. And so you got to break it down. Like what are some things you can work on to improve your self-confidence, whether it's, um, you know, working on something that, you know, that you can really hone your skills in, that you increase your confidence as you return back to work. Or it's putting together some like positive affirmations or a list of proud accomplishments. It's breaking those into the bite side that you can continuously work on that mindset and muscle so you actually feel more confident as well. Right, right. And in breaking down, like, so in breaking down your goal, whatever that may be, it really helps to feel the sense of progress, right? So after a day or a week or a month, you realize, okay, well, I've come really far. Like I, I see in my busy schedule, I'm still able to do these little milestones, as yeah. you call them, throughout the progress course of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> progress over perfection. Um, you know, especially being achievers or those with like high standards, you, you gotta, one thing I've learned, I'm just being a mom too, like since having kids, I say like, I tell myself, I focus on just one big thing a day, one big, yeah. thing, whatever that is, like one event, one thing, um, so that I don't get overwhelmed and I'm not too hard on myself and, and that's it. Yeah. 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 We actually have a question. And so I think this is a good, um, a good time to ask the question. So, um, she, so, so she asked, oh, sorry, one sec. So she asks, um, recommendations on, Sorry, recommendations on how to find a career that you truly enjoy and how to transition into that new career. All right. <laughs> All right, I see that one. Um, that's a good, that's a big question, but in terms of how to find it's a, a big career that you truly yeah. love and how to make that transition. So let's start with the first part, how to find something that you truly love. Like this is what I call like really that where coaching or the discovery, the reflection work comes in, right? So this is like a yeah. whole journey or process, right? So I'm going to offer a few questions quick tips here just to yeah. start. So one of the things I always talk about is to find something that aligns is you want to first figure out what I call like the triangle of strengths, interests, and values. So your strengths is really understanding what is it that you're truly great at? What do you naturally excel at? Like what's that superpower of yours? So really understand and assess what your core strengths are. And then the next piece is the interests. Um, so this is a whole big area of wealth in terms of interest of the type of problems you enjoy solving, type of um, conversations you enjoy talking about, type of books you enjoy reading, um, just really mapping those out in terms of really understanding your core area of interest. And the third piece is values, which is really like what is important to you? Um, you know, what are those core values of yours? So for example, like I have a core value for flexibility, for connection, for inspiration, and by having these things clear as like part of your, I call it, your, it's like your guiding compass, it's going to then help you look at opportunities, see whether it aligns with what you're truly going after as well. So that's just like a first, right. first piece there, just getting clear on those things. Another thing you can start thinking about is looking for themes and patterns. If you reflect back, you know, from your childhood days of growing up, what are some of the things that you naturally gravitate to? Or what are things that people always come to you for? right? And look for those themes and patterns. And like, for me, like, I realized like people always come to me for um, advice. I was always involved with like mentoring and coaching and training. So I know there's some sort of people element to it, right? And so here's the thing, a lot of times people tell me they want to help people, right? I want to make a difference in people's mm -hmm. lives. And so you want to dig further, what does that look like? What does that mean? You know, um, what, you know, what kind of people you want to help? What type of problems you want to solve? And that's going to help you figure out like what area to focus in as well. Okay. Now in terms of that second piece, in terms of how do I transition into the new career? So this is really that pivot, like making that change. And for those who are looking to do that, I want to tell you it is possible. It's scary. It's definitely scary. Um, it feels hard <laughs> as well. <But laughs> yeah. It's definitely yeah. possible. I just want to give, yeah. you know, anyone who's considering that this is where a lot of strategy comes into play. A lot of planning comes into play. Informational interview comes into play. So if you're looking to yes. do that, first, you definitely got to do research. Or let's just say you've identified you want to make this change. Okay. So first, you really want to understand, like, um, you know, talk to you want to understand, like, what does it take to be successful in this new area, right? Uh, so I'll, let's use coaching. Like, you know, you and I are in coaching, you know, right? yeah. like, co like coaching as an example here. You want to get into coaching. And so what does it take to even become a coach? You know, one of the first steps is getting trained. 
as a life coach like you and I went through life coaching school so that was CTI like a, yeah CTI coaching which that's like the first step right the next is like you know okay well if I want do I want to start my own business or do I actually want to be part of a company like I've had clients where I want to become part of an outplacement company as a career coach then you want to do essentially research of one is how do I get in or if I'm going to start a business how am I going to start the business uh, there right and then from there, then you want to come up with what I call like, what's your new narrative in terms of your story, your marketing documents, your messages, your branding, all of that's going to come into play there in terms of the marketing piece uh, there. Okay. So that's just a right. simple high level view. Um, but trust me, I, I, there's people I've seen, like it could take years to even make that pivot, right? Like even for me, like when I decided to start my business in 2011, I knew back in 2009, 2008, that I want to do something on my own, okay, but I wasn't ready to make that big jump. So what did I do? What I did was I quit consulting. I was in consulting, quit consulting, and I knew I wanted to start something, but I wasn't ready. And somehow I manifested, I guess, an opportunity that uh, a classmate of mine referred me for a recruitment opportunity at the business school, recruiting for MBA, executive MBA. And at that time, I remember questioning myself, like, should I take this or should I go start my business? And the way I justified it in terms of why I took on the opportunity, this is where sometimes things happen for a reason, was that I saw there was alignment. So something I always ask my client, does this opportunity align you closer to where you want to go? So this recruitment opportunity gave me what? An opportunity to um, train, you know, to deliver like workshops, to have one-on-one -on -one coffee chats with people on their career goals and what they want to do in the future. It gave me an opportunity to travel around to meet tons of people. So the way I looked at that opportunity was it was actually like a testing ground for me to meet people in my target market. I had the opportunity mm -hmm. to meet with a lot of highly ambitious professionals to really understand their career challenges and goals. I got the opportunity to present around you know, Canada and I had one-on-one -on -one conversations and I did admissions interviews. So the way I looked at it was like, this is actually gonna be really helpful to where I want to go. And so I took on that. It was your stepping stone. It was the stepping stone. So it is yeah. totally okay that you don't start like making that big jump, but you can take baby yeah. steps to go through that next jump as well. So similar to even when I got the recruiting opportunity at Google, it was the year, it was the same time that I started my business. I started my business after I got laid off. And within a, a month later, I got an offer to recruit at Google. And I asked myself, is this a good opportunity to take given that I just started my business? And I'm sure a lot of people are probably going through something similar in terms of having these conflicting decisions here. And so the way I t told myself, essentially the way I analyzed it was that it's basically a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was only one year. And it gave me the opportunity to really learn about like how to be the best of the best in the market because yeah. <laughs> part of my job was to recruit for the top two to 5% of people in the job market. And so yeah. I was like, okay, if I did this for a year, will this help me become a better career coach? And little did I know, like after starting taking on that opportunity, that first year, that's how I got started with my speaking career because of working at Google as a recruiter. I was also starting my um, speaking business and my coaching business as well. So that gave me a lot of credibility. So this is something I want to offer for any of those. Like, so you, you, you want to ask yourself, like, what are maybe those either assignments or opportunities that you can take on that will help you get to where you want to go right. in the long term as well. Right. And then that, so what I hear there is, you know, the triangle that you talked about, the strengths, interest, and values all aligned with what you were doing at both Google and Ivy. Right? Totally, totally aligned. Aligned with my strengths, aligned with my interests, aligned with my core values uh, as well. I mean, like, my, like when I did those before, I guess before I started my business, I mean, I didn't have kids yet. So I could afford to also work longer hours. <laughs> right. I was working much right. longer hours uh, back then. So this is where part of, obviously, like life priorities changes depending on, you know, where things are at of, in terms of what type of opportunities you would take on involved. Right. But I have to say, so I've had a few mom, you know, so I've had a few mom clients who have kids and are returning back to work after maternity leave. And they, they are talking about how they just want something more 
sustainable, something easier. But what they end up doing is yeah. finding something that aligns and aligns more with their values. So I have an example where she's an accountant and she was working tax season, which was tough, you know, like yeah. really long hours. It didn't align with her uh, value of being home for her kids. And so she went into estate planning, which made a little bit more sense in terms of her timing. So what, what I'm trying to say is she figured out the right balance and, and the non-negotiables as well. So I feel yeah. like there's a piece when you become a mom that it's like, what am I willing to negotiate and my non-negotiables? Do I need to work from home twice a week? Because that oh, yes. will help in, in terms of my family yeah. life. And, you know, and, and then finding the right company that will support what it is yeah. that you want. So the non-negotiables are so key, eh? I think yeah, yeah. I, I ask that question a lot to everyone I work with. Is like, what are your non-negotiables? Because that becomes part of your evaluation criteria and also your boundaries that you need to set when it comes to evaluating opportunities. And that is also going to impact your happiness and joy. Right. Because sometimes it's, it's not necessarily the job that you're doing. It's maybe the culture that you're in, right? Like yeah. it, you might love what you do, or you may hate what you do because you're in the wrong culture, you know, and, and not the right fit for, for your family life. And, and it's okay. <laughs> there yeah. are, there are companies that are different and will support, yeah. you know, for sure. so for sure. yeah. All right. Good question. <laughs> yeah, more, more um, people joining in, I see. I see that. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So let's move on. So now we have, um, so it's interesting because you talked about um, layoffs. So why don't we go there? So um, in this time, um, you know, um, there's a situation where mom is laid off, um, probably because of the pandemic, um, and she starts, she starts wondering, like, okay, so let's talk about the job search and how does she go about, you know, starting a job search, especially during this time? and feeling a little bit uncertain about um, about things, you mm -hmm. know, about the time right now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to approach it. I mean, whether the mom or anyone else, like, you know, could have faced the situation of a layoff, right? But I think first things first, before even tackling the job search, um, is a few things. One is you got to check on your own emotional well-being in terms of your own mental health that is so so key like if you're not in the right mental state it is really hard to tackle the job search so if you just face a situation that you just lost your job take that time to process those emotions talk to someone find the people you need to provide you that emotional support to make you feel more confident again because I know that right. could bring a lot of stress and anxiety like I've been working with a lot of clients right now in that situation and then before you can even tackle the job search, you gotta take care of yourself first, okay? So that's the first step, I would say, is taking care of yourself. Then the next step is really looking and assessing first in terms of your own current state in your own home, I think. Like this is even before the job search, is like what, um, I guess like really like even talking to your spouse and partner in terms of your own financial situation as well, right? Of, because this will impact the choices that you make in terms of the jobs that you would take on as well, right? Are you mm. looking for a bridge job or are you looking for something, you know, um, something that really challenging? Like that, that's a discussion you need to have in your own household. And then from right. there, you also need to set up, essentially communicate a schedule in terms of how you're going to balance your job search. Meaning like, are you going to dedicate two hours a day, 30 minutes a day to tackle your job search or career planning? You need to have that communication uh, in place because if you don't have that essentially that support it's really going to be hard so even myself right now running my own business um my my husband has a full-time job as well he's a very busy schedule and we set up for me in my business a schedule i take calls from 10 to 12 and like 2 30 to 4 because that's when like my kids are out in the car right now right now that's what we've communicated of my schedule in the morning my mother-in-law comes over to look after the kids and so I know from that stability standpoint, or it's a certainty standpoint, I know that's the time where I can be working on me or working on my business. So mm -hmm. for those who have kids, you have to have that set up first, because then you can start planning. We're like, okay, once I know I got this much time, then you can set goals of saying, okay, today I'm going to work on my resume. 
next week, I'm going to work on LinkedIn. The week after, I'm going to work on like reaching out networking. to people. Networking. Because mm-hmm. once even, even networking, networking takes time. Even when prior to COVID, people tell me like finding a job or networking, it could take up, you know, quite some time. So you got to block off calendar for that as well. So if you don't have those foundations set up, it's really, really hard to tackle the job search and go do any type of networking there. Okay. Right. Um, is that helping yeah. just where to start? Yeah. How to start? I mean, yeah. that's what's really key about what you said was the mental health piece. Like first it's take care of yourself because yeah. that is, that's so important, especially during this time that, yeah, no, it's, that's good. And then after that, then work on the small milestones, which we talked about earlier, you know, yeah. is it your yeah. resume, then your LinkedIn. Yeah. The other thing yes. I've, I've heard too, like, you know, if you are if anyone's in a situation, either yourself or your spouse is unemployed, I think just discussing having those discussion or boundaries of when to talk about the job search or when to provide accountability like in terms of support versus mm-hmm. or check-ins. I think that is so key as well, because I, I've heard also incidents where people feel pressured, you know, by their spouse that, you know, that have they found a job yet or not. And, and so having those conversations of when to have those certain conversations is key uh, as well. Right. For your relationship. <laughs> really, yeah, for, for your relationship. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Awesome. Okay. So, um, so another question is, um, so she doesn't feel fulfilled in her current role. Um, where does she start? This is interesting because it was similar to, I think the question we answered where, Mm -hmm. but anything else to add? Uh, so this is like that common scenario feeling stuck, lost Mm -hmm. motivation, not really happy, right? It's that common state of just feeling I'm not truly fulfilled. Um, It it honestly goes back to doing the self-reflection work. This is where that clear clarity, um, the introspection type of work. So I think, you know, you know, just to maybe a few things, I think one is either you talk to people, right? Either your own Mm -hmm. friends or people in those um, uh, careers that you aspire to be to for informational interviews. Um, second is like, you know, reading some books, like there's a tons of books or even podcasts to check out as well. Like one of the book I recommend is designing your life, which is a great book on, um, looking at your whole life holistically as well. Um, but that's another area. I mean, a third is, I mean, working with a coach, like a career coach who can really help you look at that 360 of seeing things from different perspective and really mm-hmm. evaluating like your overall, even personality, your style, your preferences beyond just that strengths and just values is really looking as a whole even thinking of your overall um dream job like what does that really look like what does the vision of your life look like as well and how does career really fit in to your life and asking yourself like what does true happiness and success mean to you um i know for me like i've ever since i had kids um even my definition of success and happiness changed i think before it kids, does. it was all about yeah climbing up the corporate ladder, getting that next promotion, getting that next big thing. And somehow just through my own personal um, discovery journey that I took on, um, it really made me reflect what's really, truly, truly important and what's going to really make me happy. And it was because of that that gave me the courage um, and the confidence to actually to start my business as well. Like when you have that conviction and clarity of what you really, really want, that's what's going to give you that momentum to move forward as well. Right, right. And that, that, that's so key. The figuring out what it is that you want is it's, it's hard to do without knowing what's out there. So like the one thing that really helped me when I was going through my own was the informational interviews. And Diana, you were so, you were so key in providing the right support You know, like the right people I remember during that time, um, speaking to marketing managers and asking them all these questions about how, what it is that they love about their job and what it is that they enjoy doing and and seeing if that aligned with what it is that I liked. And and it was very interesting to to go through that experience. For sure. And you know what's the key to what I'm learning right now, even as a coach, I, I, you know, do networking chats as well. I meet other coaches. 
what's so fascinating is say we may be doing similar things as a career coach or leadership coach, mindset coach, but the way we approach it in terms of our business model, our offering could be different. So as an example, like, like for me, I've been offering one-on-one coaching the last nine years. And for some, they want to do like group coaching or um, training. So the model, the business model is so different depending on what you enjoy as well. So this is where Mm -hmm. I want to encourage people, like even though you do the informational interviews, also ask yourself, how would I design it? How would I like it? What would make me truly fulfilled um, uh, and satisfied as well? Right, right. And it reminds me actually, so um, so my daughter was 18 months and I actually um, didn't come back to the business. I didn't know what I truly wanted. I needed to self-reflect after having after her. So it took her, me... Yeah. It took me 18 months. <laughs> I thought I, I was really hard on myself for, for taking so long because I really enjoy coaching. But it got but I got to a point where I started realizing the who I wanted to serve had changed. And mm-hmm. so now dealing so so you know, talking to moms and kind of being a coach for moms is what you want. It, it yeah, it took a lot of self-reflection to get there, but it I realized that that's that's the direction I want to head in. And it was, it was really difficult. It's, it's very challenging because then you're closing. To me, it felt like I was closing myself off to other opportunities. Yeah. But I yeah. think that that's why it takes time to do the yeah. reflection and to really do the research to know yeah. that that's right. And it's okay to pivot. I think this is like a few things what I'm hearing is one, it's okay to take time to pause. You know, it's okay to take time to pause to reflect and slow down. Because when you slow down, that's when you get these insights and it will help you to speed up as well. And pivoting is not a bad thing either, right? Like you obviously you just, you need to get clear on it and having a plan uh, with that. But I think something what I'm hearing too, and I, I experienced this as you're sharing this, like after I had my second, uh, second one back in 2017. So last year, 2018 or what is it? We're 2020. Last year, yeah. <laughs> I took on, I took on also a role as a career advisor at a school, at a university. And yes, what, yes. what was interesting, while I was still like, you know, running, you know, a thriving business, and the reason why I took it on, and it's, and I don't know, if I wanted to share this, because some people could relate to this, was that I felt like because after having two kids, and I was home a lot, I was craving for more connection, like craving for just putting myself out there or even more, because even before kids, I was out there doing speaking events almost every week, like I did 50 speaking events a week. So once I had kids, I switched everything online and I felt that I was really missing that connection. So anyhow, I took on this opportunity as a career advisor uh, at the university and I, within one month starting the job, I got so sick. I was burnt out. I, I was, I was sick for a long time. I could not walk, move, eat or anything. And I didn't realize at first I was burnt out, but it was because I had such a full schedule with having a young family, running a business, being in a full-time role meeting tons of people as well, like fully booked, scheduled. And I had to come back to myself, even though the opportunity aligned with my strengths, interests, and values, it did not align with my non-negotiable, which mm. was flexibility. <laughs> um, it did not align with that, meaning not having the flexibility to um, like work from, home, work from home, for example. I know a lot of working parents would want to have also that. So I had to make a decision, um, you know, a few months in, like, do I continue or do I leave? And for me, the decision was obviously I had, I had to leave because one was for my own mental health and my health. And second, it was for my family. And third, it was also for, for my business as well. So it, it was a tough decision, but, um, and I don't regret it because it actually gave me a better perspective of the challenges young parents go through um, after having kids where you, you're still really ambitious. You want to still like do amazing things. But then there also there are sometimes um, restrictions or sacrifices that you need to make because there are things that are out of your control where like, let's say a young one, your kid gets sick from daycare and you need to be back home just like that. Right. right? Yeah. Those things you need, you, you need to have that. You need flexibility. You need yeah. Flexibility. Right. So, so yeah, so it's not an easy decision for those who are listening uh, to this. You got to trust yourself. Like, there's no right or bad decision. You just have to like trust yourself what's best for you and your family. Right. Right. That's good. All right. So um, the last scenario I have is networking. So um, you talked a little bit about networking, but, um, and I know you're very creative. So during the lockdown or during quarantine, um, how 
can someone network? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So first of all, like networking, I always talk about my ABC rule, always be connecting anytime, anywhere, whether it's online or offline, right? You just never know when opportunities may come your way. Okay. So with regards to right now, like right now, like being um, the situation that we're in, I think it's actually a bit easier to network, like in terms of online, because people are at home. So it's actually mm. easier to reach out. Now, mind you, though, at the same time, people may, depending on people's availability or how they are in terms of their mental state, so that it may not be the best time to have like certain conversations, right? So this is where you need to gauge. But I think that from a, what I've seen um, right now, like since this pandemic happened, LinkedIn has been a fantastic tool to network, to reach out to people, to connect, to post content. I have seen so many people getting opportunities through just reaching out or posting a, a post on, on LinkedIn as well. So, so that's something just to, to keep in mind. Now, what I've, what I've been doing, like personally, um, you know, as a coach and as a facilitator and trainer, I've started to hold, host um, networking events as well, like speed networking events. And one thing what I'm learning is that people do crave the connection. I, I think now more than ever, because, you know, we're, we're not out as much, we're also craving for that human connection. And I think being more empathetic is key, like, you know, during times like this, like really checking in on how people are doing, right? Not just about the work, but how are you doing at home with your family? Um, you know, just like, how, how are you managing all this? I think that really is also what's going to connect with people like people can relate to those challenges as well like I've right. had I've had like even recently like networking conversations where all of a sudden my my uh, almost five-year-old my son will just come into the video call as well <laughs> and it's a great icebreaker right it's a great icebreaker like I don't get upset about it I'm like you know it is what it is like you know maybe they just want to come say hello or the next day and and so also just knowing that has changed right in terms of the networking of what it used to be I think I think pre-COVID like now like you know just um so being understanding about that is so key there yeah yeah and so um so reaching out through LinkedIn that's what I'm hearing as a big resource to use right now yes reaching out on LinkedIn I mean the first if those who are starting out with networking I always recommend to start out with your own network to get your feet wet right talk to your friends talk to your colleagues your warm contacts warm contacts yeah your classmates from school start there okay and, and the key here is you want to have a personal type of outreach meaning um you can have like what I, you can start with a template but you personalize it based on what you know about this person's interest or their profession so that you can have specific make specific comments and connection there because that's going to increase the response rate and the likelihood of getting um a chat conversation like i had a client recently like she's really tailored her responses to people she wanted to talk to, she hasn't talked to for over a decade, like from her university days, um, or reached out to someone she did her MBA with. And because she personalized those outreach messages, she got responses like instantly and like a chat, like, you know, the following week there. So when you take time to do that, it really adds that personal touch, right? Mm -hmm. Once you get your feet wet and getting more confident and talking to people you know, then you move into the cold contact, meaning people you don't know. So you can look for them on LinkedIn by your target companies or target industry, target job titles. That's how you're going to search for those people to network with. Another way is essentially is to ask for referrals. So the people that you know that you've built a relationship with, you ask them if they know anyone that they can introduce you to, to right. um, follow up. Now, or you, you actually yeah. see, you actually yeah. go into their network and see if there's someone that you want to talk to, right? Yeah. So, Yes, you can also I remember I did that activity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That and adding value. So when you are networking, I remember your message to me was always make sure that you are the one adding value, right? Yeah. In the conversation. So yeah. when you are networking, make sure that the person feels that, oh, this is worth their time. Yeah, it's all about the give, give, give before you get as well. So as much as you are seeking advice and insights, you also want to offer your perspective, um, share your experience as well, or share your story, you know, because they can also learn from it. You just never know uh, as well. Um, or follow up with something interesting that they mentioned as well, like a, let's say a white paper or an article that could be helpful uh, as well. You know, oftentimes I hear from job seekers, they feel like they have nothing to offer because they're the ones seeking for help. 
And I think it's just a mindset shift. You know, the, the mindset shift needs to be okay. Like, yes, I am seeking your advice, but you also want to see yourself, which ties in self-confidence here is, you know, what's something valuable that I can share? What's something valuable I can offer? Um, what's like an area that I know better than anyone else that would be helpful um, to share there? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, awesome. I just want to add one thing about networking yep. is um, in terms of like the what not to do, I would say is, you know, because the key here with a lot of the networking is you first need to really focus on building the relationships and the rapport, the likability factor before asking for any big favors. So what I mean by this is first, you want to focus on just seeking advice and insights. If you're looking to get someone to help you in terms of making an introduction or referral or critiquing your resume, um, you really need to build that relationship first. Uh, the thing is, like, it's really hard for someone to endorse you or refer you if they don't know you. Right. That is so, yeah. so key. I've seen people make mistakes where they just jump right into, as an example, I would make an introduction to, uh, for a client and they jump right into asking this person for a referral without even having a call or conversation first. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a big no, no, because then my friend or contact would then like, do you know this person? Should I refer them? And so the effort needs to be there. Otherwise, it will feel very transactional there. Right, right. <laughs> but again, going back to the connection, the connection needs to be built, right? Yes, like the trust and rapport. So, yeah. so key, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's so easy these days now uh, for you to go on LinkedIn to find those mutual connections. Um, but it's, you really want to make sure the person you're asking, you check in first before you ask for, let's say, an introduction or request, like checking, like, do you know this person well? Because honestly, even for me, like, I have people who I just connected through LinkedIn who I've never met in my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I may not be able to, I can't really tell much or, you know, I'll, if I can make an introduction, I will. But if, if I don't know much, there's not much, like, much I can do. Right. So part of it is also checking in, like, you know, how well do you know this person? Right. Right. Very interesting. So, um, so I'm wondering, are there any questions um, from everyone, anyone who's watching? We had the one. Yeah. We have really good point. <laughs> Oops. Okay. So I don't think there's any questions, but yeah. those were my scenarios. And thank you so much, Diana. This was so informative. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my pleasure. I'm curious to know, like, um, for you, um, yeah. you know, besides the scenarios, like, what are other maybe common challenges that you're hearing? Oh, we forgot to talk about self-confidence, actually. We could talk about that. Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. Maybe scenario, actually. Let's talk a little bit about that because um, I'm sure, like, you know, even for me, I hear it from a lot of job seekers. Like, if you've been out of a job, or you've been looking for quite some time, or you're looking to return back to work, um, oftentimes those self-doubts could creep in. 100%. Actually, yes, and we we forgot something else, the re-entering yeah. the workforce. Re-entering, okay, we'll talk. So this ties nicely into this. So yeah, you know, I think having so. that self-doubt is normal. You know, it is, so, it is normal to have that because you feel maybe a little either rusty or you feel that you don't, um, you're, you're not up to date, you know, there's, there's so many of these things creep in like that fear, right? Like, so, so first is really recognizing these fears. Like what are those fears that you um, are recognizing or what are those stories that you're telling yourself? Right? That's the first step. Okay. And then from there, it's, it is really changing the narrative or changing like those stories the beliefs that you were telling yourself to, to help you change that uh, narrative. Another thing around, I would say of dealing with those self doubts or building your confidence it is really looking back in terms of things that you value about yourself. So I always talk about this oh. that ties back into self-care, self-love, self-worth, self-value. It's all about looking back inward of what do I really admire about myself? What am I really proud of? What am I really good at? Right. So these are things you want to journal and reflect on. If you're really not sure, this is where you can have a discussion with your friend, with your spouse, with your coworkers. Or like one of the exercises I get my clients to do is send out a perception, perception survey where it's about like, you know, what are the words you use to describe me? How do I add value? How do you describe my leadership style or communication style? And that's a great way to just build your confidence, you know, in terms of reminding yourself of who you are, right? I recently had a client like, you know, who she, she lost her job and um, was feeling really stressed uh, as well. Like it, it just, it just happened recently. And she had interviews coming up, 
but she wasn't feeling in the, she wasn't in the right state, right? Wasn't in the right state to go for this interview. And so, you know, we worked on all these like essentially positive affirmation exercises, visualization exercise in terms of seeing yourself like being that powerful, you know, person, like thinking back a time when you were at your best self. Oh, um, yes. You know, that type of exercise or doing like the power poses, right? To get her in that right state. And it really helped her. Another thing she did like before up, leading up to the interview was she essentially reached out to her friends, you know, her board of advisors or board of champions, of friends reminding her of how amazing she is. And that helped her even get into that right state, that strength as well. Okay. Yeah. So I always talk about before going in an interview, it's like finding your anchor, like what's going to give you that strength. Like think about a time when you were at your best and how did you show up? How did you communicate? Right. And instantly yeah. you can get back into that power state there. That visualization is so, so key. And it's very, it, it, it empowers, I, I know I do it with my clients and it really empowers them in that moment to think like, wow, what did I do at that time? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Diana, I remember um, something else that we, we did um, was you made me write a list and I do this with clients too, of 50 of my 50 accomplishments. Yeah. And I remember thinking very overwhelmed. I was very overwhelmed in the beginning thinking I decreased that now. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> no, you shouldn't. No, 50 is great. Yeah. No, 50, 50 is really good because it really makes you think about mm-hmm. all everything. Right. Like, yeah, so yeah. big and small. Right. Like, I, I think that that's so valuable because it really got me to think really more creatively and more. You, you start to think about the little things that you've accomplished that are also just as important as the big things. Right. Yeah. And so so I don't know. I, I, I remember that. And um, I, I had that list. It gave me a lot of confidence when I was going for my interviews. Um, or just, you know, going in for a big presentation or for example today, right? Like having this live, it's, it's pretty nerve wracking. So, so just thinking of all of the things I've accomplished up until now, that's gotten me to this point. It's, it's such a good tool, I think, to have in your back pocket to remind yourself, like, I mean, if we're speaking to moms out there, you gave birth, (laughs) like that's a huge accomplishment, you know, like (laughs) if you can't think of anything, it's just like personally, professionally, like there's so much that we do and we've done. So I'm seeing the hearts right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because it's it's, true. Yeah. You've got to find that, um, like you said, like, you know, whether it's giving birth, I, for me, like I, there is like one of my proud moments was like even like walking on fire like when I went to the Tony Robbins training. Tony Robbins yeah and that's what really gave me the strength because I knew I had to get in the right state to be powerful to feel like strong and that makes a huge difference like when we talk about back to career or job search your confidence the way you show up the way you speak and the way you project your voice does have an impact in terms of influencing um, how you're perceived and also impact of the salary that you'll get as well, right? Because mm. if you don't believe that you're worth it, that you're valuable, um, they're just going to give you whatever they think is best. But if you believe like, hey, like I'm worth this much, it really helps with uh, the salary negotiation uh, as well. Again, oh, you were so, ins- you're so instrumental with salary negotiations. I remember when I was negotiating my salary, it's, you write a package for what you believe you get and and you don't you don't do like you don't um you don't back down you don't back down yeah that's the right word and and I remember when I was negotiating it was awesome you're it's because again you need to have the confidence to go in and say I am worth this much (laughs) totally totally. for those who are just joining right now but this whole self negotiation thing so one of the things is to be specific here, one is you need to know where you're at right now. Are you um, within the market rate? Are you above or below or not? Because that's going to help you understand your negotiation power. Okay. And then through your research, by looking at, say, Glassdoor, salary.com, um, you want to understand what your range is. And then when, if you ever get asked by an employer, recruiter, what's your expectation, you always want to give a range because the range is what's going to give you room for negotiation. Okay. So you should always know what your bare minimum is. And then you want to then ask for something higher in terms of that middle upper range there. And so that you give that range that's not the mid, your minimum. It's actually your mid and to, to the max there. Okay, so that's what's going to give room for negotiation. Now, what's key here is, um, you know, I always say don't start a negotiation 
until you've actually got the offer. And um, unless you know you're going to take the offer, don't start a negotiation. Right. Okay. Because otherwise it's just it's disrespectful there. Okay. Um, so you got to understand that those are some of the just minor like, tactics that you have to have understand in there. And why confidence is so key here is um, it does play a huge role in how much more they're going to give you. Okay. I just had a client actually with an internal a promotion. Okay. We haven't even talked about promotion here. Who received a promotion. And traditionally, when you get a promotion or get a, an offer internally, the jump of your salary is less than you going externally. Like if you want right. to make more, you got to make a jump externally to another company. So usually internally, it could be what, like 5% increase or 10%? Yeah, 10%. Increase, that's what I've heard. You know, like 10 like, or, you know, that's usually that company policy range. Okay. And so that's exactly what my client got here. And she asked me, like, should I negotiate? And I was like, you know, what do you think? And, and she did ask her. So the, the HR actually asked her um, whether she had like a PhD, like to, to essentially to get, a, to get a, a higher raise or the next level, like whether she had a PhD. And like, I don't have a PhD, but I got two masters. <laughs> Does that count? So countering, meaning like, I don't have a PhD, but I got two masters. Right. Yeah. And and also gave the ex expected expected range, right, based on what she's researched the market value, and also the companies that she's interviewing. So at the end, she got twenty one percent more. Wow. And that just goes down to confidence and knowing what you're worth. Totally and totally. Right. Yeah. And so I was so proud of that because, especially for internal promotions, it's so easy to accept because they're like. Oh, that's the band that you're in. That's what we can, that's the only thing we can do for you. But if you're confident, say like, hey, like this is what I can offer in this role based on my skills and experience. And this is what I understand what the expectation is and what the market rate is. You know, what can we do here? Right. And if they really want to keep you, if they really want to keep you and they know that you're looking for other opportunities, they're going to do something about it. They are. You heard it from a recruiter's mouth. <laughs> they are going to do something about it. Okay. They really, really, I've seen it. I've seen it. You just remind me of another client. It's similar. Another mom as well. She got another offer at a competitor, much more money. I think at least 30% more than what she was making um, before. And the boss was trying, her boss was trying to keep her and they did make a counter. Not exactly, but similar. But at the, like she, at the end, she still left because of, it wasn't just the money, it was the opportunity as well. But it was so fascinating because she didn't think they would, I think what gave her the con it was giving her the confidence. She didn't think she could actually get that much more internally. But right. I guess because she was also considered a valuable, a valuable hire at the company as well. Like the, the, the employer was willing to, her boss was really trying to keep her to retain her. Right. It's amazing. I mean, there's always room for negotiation, right? And always. even, even if you're told that, no, this is it. There's always a way, and it's just a matter of again confidence to get. It ties um, into it. It all ties into it. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I was going to remind people is that um, salary negotiation it does not have to be just be your base salary. It could be many things. It could be bonuses, stock options, vacation, car allowance, many things like you know flexibility to work from home. All those things could be negotiated as well. So I have seen like, you know, clients or even friends, like, you know, strategically done and also depending on the role that you're in, like you can really negotiate a lot more. Like I've seen people get six figures more uh, as well. It's crazy. Um, but this is where like the confidence need to come through. If you don't have confidence, it's, it's not going to work. And there, it also sounds like creativity. So it's, so yeah. if you're just thinking about your base salary and that's it, you may not get it, but there are other ways. So that's there interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this also ties back to re-entering the workforce. So we mm. haven't spoken about that. So um, a scenario where um, someone is out of work, um, either mat leave or an extended period of time where, you know, they decided to take care of their kids perhaps. Um, but it's been a while. How do they re-enter and maybe market or brand you know you talk about branding yourself yeah um how do they get back into the the workforce and market themselves yeah that's such a great question um in terms of re-entering and, and I, i've worked with quite a few clients in that space and i think that um 
you know, it does require a little bit of planning because if you're, it depends on thinking either, either one is either you're on the mat leave, meaning you still have a little one or you took an extended time off to look after kids or family, right? Um, either way, it requires some strategic planning, right? Meaning one we're going back to is really understanding where are you at now in your life and what you really need in order to make it work as well, right? Um, and the other thing is doing a lot of market research, like whether it's informational interviews, but really understand how has the market changed in your industry, your company, the role, what, how are things have changed? Because if you understand that, you understand that lingo, it will really help you when it comes to networking uh, as well. So there's a lot of this prep work that can be done beforehand to help. I'll give you a specific scenario. Like I recently met someone who took some time off and actually re-entered the workforce with a promotion from a manager to a senior manager level role, which I was really intrigued by as well. And, and I asked her like, how does she do that? Because it, it, it's actually harder to get a promotion when you re-enter that workforce, okay? Right. So what, was, what was really fascinating, what she shared with me was that before she went on her leave, she already started her networking. She already started meeting people at the organization in different departments to start the relationship building. She did informational interviews to really understand their business challenges, what it's like working there, what they're looking for. So during her time off, she stayed in touch with these people. This was like that year or year and a half time that she was off to nurture those relationships and making the effort to show up into the office to stay up to date on what's happening. Mm. And when she came back, she actually not only she got a prom- not only she got a promotion, she moved into a different department. Which is really really rare. In order for that to happen, this is where the networking comes in. This is where also showcasing your value, your aspirations, your ambition as well that it needs to shine through, which ties into also your confidence. Um, so that to me it's strategic planning like it didn't just happen they're like oh yeah we're going to promote you in a different department it was also she already planted the seed before even going on the leave so for those in that situation we're already let's say on the leave right now i think you got to start you got to start nurturing those relationships start you know reconnecting with your colleagues of hey how have things changed what's new right now you know what's what's happening in the workplace right now how you know what, what are the latest priorities and projects who are the new leaders right um, those are the things that you need to start gathering in terms of insights and information in order to help you to, to make that move there. Right. Right. Interesting. And so um, we do have a question. Um, and the question was, how can you initiate an informational interview? Mm, it's not that complicated um, in terms of information interview. It, it is really outreach through like a, just a message first. And so the way you want to do it is one is do some research. Like, so before even reaching out, you first need to have a criteria of what kind of people you want to meet, meaning in terms of their experiences, um, companies that they worked at, the roles that worked at. So just have that criteria list because that's going to help you then narrow down who to reach out to. Once you've narrowed that down and you've got those people, you want to then essentially study their profile like on LinkedIn. This is specifically LinkedIn here. And essentially identify like what are some in your spreadsheet that you have that you want to reach out, have a column on reason for reaching out. What is it that you want to learn from them? What do you admire about them? Okay, so have that reason. And so when you then craft your outreach message, not only you're going to talk about yourself, you're actually going to focus on them. You want to have an acknowledgement of what do you admire about their background experience and what would you like to learn from them? And then you put an ask, have a call to action of, you know, I would like to find out more about your experience or would like to hear more about your insights on this. Do you have uh, time for a 15 to 20 minute chat? You make, you make that request as a, a question. Um, and always have like a quick type of question because then that's more likely to have a response, okay? So avoid starting that first email with a list of questions because that's very overwhelming. You just wanna reach out to say hello, acknowledge, I would like to have a chat. Would you be willing to have a chat? And if they respond saying no, if they don't have time, then maybe you can ask them like, Hello. <laughs> I don't know if you heard what I said, but I think we only get an hour. Diana, we went over an hour. <laughs> this is only supposed to be an hour. But yeah, it, it, I, I wondered what that was. There was a little message saying six, six, six 
remaining, six seconds remaining. And so now we know. <laughs> now you know. You went over the hour. Okay, we were something something very juicy. I forgot what we were talking uh, about. I know, I know. <laughs> and then me trying to figure everything out. So we were talking, oh man, um, we what, what was the last thing you said? <laughs> it was about re-entering the workforce. It was about re-entering the oh, workforce. Oh, the informational yeah. interviews, how to get the informational interviews. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so the informational uh, interviews. So, so we talked about how, first of all, you want to have a criteria list of what kind of people you want to meet with, right? So that you can get really clear on that. Yes. And then from there, um, you want to have a column of like reason why you want to connect, what you admire about them. So when you actually reach out, you can tailor your message to this person's needs of really indicating what's your purpose, reason for reaching out, what you admire about them. And then you want to put a request on um, and ask, you know, would you have time for a 15, 20 minute chat or 30 minutes? Um, 20 minutes is usually better, like, because I think most likely to say yes, um, to, to connect in the next few weeks, right? So always make it a question, because uh, that's where you're more likely to get a response, okay? If they say yes, that's great. You always ask what time works best for them, because you are right. asking for their time, okay? What works best for them, and, you know, what's the best way to connect by phone or through, let's say, Zoom, um, and then you set it up. So you can then set up, be proactive and setting up that calendar invite. If it's by a phone call, I always recommend that the person who's asking for their time to call, because you're more likely, it's more likely to happen than waiting for someone to call you when you're seeking for help. Right, right. Okay? That's just a strategy here. It's to always be the proactive one. Um, and then prior, the day before the meeting, you know, sometimes things could get canceled because you're not the priority, especially if it's a cold contact. They don't know you yet. You're not the priority. So the day before the meeting, ideally 24 hours, you follow up with an email, you know, that I want to confirm that you're still good with this time. Here is uh, my meeting agenda and the questions that I have. So it's just send like a couple, like, you know, three to five questions or your agenda of what you would like to discuss. So that way it shows your interest, your eagerness, and that you're well prepared as well. And it's more likely going to keep the meeting because they see that you're prepared for the meeting so there. Okay. And yeah, and an agenda gives them um, a guideline as to what they have to prepare. Sometimes I, I, I find that having an agenda in a meeting prepares me for what we're going to be talking about. So it, they're maybe less likely to cancel because they know that, okay, like these are the questions. This is what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Yes. I, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having the agenda really, really helps there. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Yes. Information interview. Yeah, I feel I know that um, networking is one of the biggest challenge I always hear. And uh, one of the other thing is like, what do I say? Like, when I reach out to them? What do I talk about? Um, you know what, you know, at the end of the day, you want to look at networking as really like connecting, you're connecting with like a friend, right? It just happens to be someone you don't know yet. And yeah. you really want to just learn. It's all about learning first. Yeah, I would I would change the, the term. So it, I, I, I wouldn't all the um, all the meetings that I did, I just called them informational interviews, right? And so it just, I mean, I guess it's the same thing, but it it really helps to say, okay, well, I'm just gathering information and research yeah. on, you know, on the role that you're in. And all of a sudden, the the feeling doesn't become, oh, she's after something. It's just, oh, she wants me to talk about myself. Okay, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it just becomes a little less threatening, perhaps. For sure, yeah. Now, for those who are job seeking, okay, so what's going to happen is you start with informational interviews, which, which is really about informational gathering. As you've done, like, let's say half a dozen, a dozen of these meetings, it should progress if you're looking for a job to more what I call like a promotional meeting, meaning that you should get to the state where you should be promoting yourself more. Um, because your next goal is to get someone to refer you for an opportunity um, mm -hmm. or be able to really highlight how amazing you are, okay? So once you get your, you know, have that half a dozen so meetings, you should be able to progress to meeting with more senior people, hiring managers, recruiters, people of influence, um, decision makers, and those type of meetings should be a bit more promotional in terms of selling your unique selling points, your unique value proposition, and be really clear what you're looking for. And you want to showcase that you've already done your research through all these like informational meetings and online research as well. So that should be the progression, okay? Because I've seen some people where they just do tons of informational meetings and don't move anywhere. And it's because they don't move into that next state or level of selling themselves. A lot of people feel uncomfortable selling themselves. 
So it is so key that you practice and get yourself into that next level that you can really pitch your elevator pitch at the end of the day. Right. Now I have a question for you. So when you, so when it's say a cold contact, you were saying that you want to um, introduce yourself, but you did mention not to send your resume, right? So, so could it be, so just wondering, um, so after you've had the, the call, right? So now, now it's a warm, let's say it's a warm contact because they've, they've talked to you and the thank you note, would that be a good time to send the resume as a, a like a, a thank you? Like, thank you so much for meeting with me. I'm just sending you my resume because I just wanted to know um, how my skills line up with a position, you know, like kind of wording it there. So, so it, yeah. um, it, it's a strategic way of getting your resume to them yeah. as well as them having it. Cause I remember sending my resume and I can't remember, I feel like I sent it when I was asking them for the information interview. I don't remember, but, um, but it was a great way for them to remember or keep me on file for later times when they were hiring for that position. Yeah. So I'm just wondering at what point and yeah. how do you send yeah. that? Yeah. So I think it depends on who you're talking to. If you, if, if the initial meeting you're talking to a hiring manager, you probably want to give them the resume already before the meeting. But if it's something more like an informational meeting, ideally during the call, the call or the chat, you want to ask them, you know, or they, or they either offer you to follow up with your resume or they make a referral that you follow okay. up with a, your resume and your message. Um, so ideally you have that conversation first, like, would it be okay if I send you my resume to keep me on file? If you have that discussion around like job search, essentially, okay. um, here's one thing I always recommend. Um, if you want to get people to help you, meaning you want people to refer you for something, you make it super easy for them to endorse you. And the way to do that is you write what I call a referral message, like a third person bio about you in terms of who you are, what you're looking for. What are the top three things that you have to offer there? And so that they can easily copy and paste that message to forward to their colleagues or friends. And then you can attach that resume there. So what I'm trying to say is that you have to separate that email. If you say, oh yeah, send me that uh, email or the message that I can forward off to my colleague. Write it a separate email so that they can easily, like literally just click forward and forward your resume and message to whoever. Mm -hmm. The right person. The okay. right person. Yeah. Right. That's a strategy okay. there. Okay. Okay. So we have two more questions. Okay. How are you doing for time? Just uh, checking I in. I think I'm good for a couple, another within 10 minutes before my kids come back in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Me too. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're okay. It's hot outside today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right. So we'll be quick. So, um, so what are, because they're good questions, so we should get to them. So what are some good ways to sell yourself? Mm. Oh, what a good way to say. So that's a great question. Actually, speaking of this, um, can I just quickly mention before I know we're going to wrap up soon is that I have yeah. a free webinar on how to differentiate as top talent. And it's all about how to brand market sell yourself effectively. It's on June 14th from 2.30 to 4. And so for those who are really interested in learning how to sell yourself, like come join my webinar. Just go to my website at www.mymarketability.com. Um, or just click on the bio in my um, Instagram here so that you can sign up. It's going to be, it's a free webinar. So highly recommend that. Okay. So a few yeah. quick tips in terms of how to sell yourself. So this depends on your situation or the scenario. But I'm assuming either you're going through a networking scenario and you need to sell yourself. So one of the things is one is you want to be able to sell essentially your strengths. So like what are the top three things that you're really good at or what are you really known for? And from there, you want to back it up with a proof. So give a highlight in terms of a story of a proud accomplishment that essentially would sell these core strengths of yours, okay? It would be like one, one way, because you don't want to be fluffy. You want to give a proof to showcase you have those uh, skills out there, okay? Um, another is in terms of selling yourself, there's like a strengths piece. Another one is really showcasing in terms of your passion, right? For those who don't necessarily have enough experience, you want to talk more about your passion, your interests, your desires, and what are you doing to essentially to pursue this passion as well. So that showcase in terms of the dedication and commitment um, to this mm -hmm. new area as well. Okay, so that's totally possible. Another way to sell yourself, like, you know, I've had clients who've made huge pivots from different industries to another whole new profession. 
And so another way to show sell yourself is really showcasing you are a quick learner, meaning that you've done tons of prep and you know a lot about this new industry, a lot about this new role, and showcasing that you're smart and a quick learner there. Okay. I I've had a client, you know, you probably remember this person, but it's someone who which um um, it was an MBA grad going from the government industry to um, the telco industry yes, in product yes. management. And yes. it seemed impossible at first, right? Being in government to tech to then like product management. And what stood out was he was so well prepared. He knew this new industry inside and out. He talked to over a dozen people at this new company. He got referred by me, his friend. Um, the person I referred him, he referred him as well. And it took a lot of hard work and dedication. So not only he showcased he was passionate, he showcased he was smart and a quick learner. Um, he showcased like, you know, he was really dedicated to making this change. And that's how he got hired. And now he's in consulting now. And so um, I really want to give that hope, you know, for people who think like, you know, can I do this? Yes, it does take a lot of work and time, but it's certainly possible there. Nice. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Okay. And then, and and that means to, uh, the other thing was, if you want more information, your webinar, <laughs> that's where you will yeah. really delve into it. Oh, I'm going to go through a whole framework and models and steps. Uh, for those who know me, like I, I have tons of step-by-step -step that I teach and it's like a PowerPoint presentation. And so final question uh, before we wrap up. So also cover letters, are they still important? What is the modern cover letter these days? <laughs> Cover letters. So good I question. Think it's, it's a good question. There's still a need. From my experience as a recruiter, it's not the first thing a recruiter would read. The first thing we'll usually read is the resume and the LinkedIn. Cover letter is like more like a nice to have. Um, if you're looking to make a big pivot, it's definitely necessary, I would say. If the job application isn't asked for, you don't need it. These days, if you're trying to reach out to like a recruiter or a high manager, you can use basically replace your email as like a cover letter, right? That intro message out there. Um, but definitely, uh, if you're like the cover letter usually is used also when you're like in that top finalist and they're trying to also decide the cover letter also could help give hints and clues as well in terms of how you tell your story and how long you sell yourself there. Mm, okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what else? So one, one more thing. Um, so she asks, can you pin the web, uh, the webinar? So, um, should I, I can write a comment. So should I, or can you write a comment? Uh, yeah, you... it's a little hard to do. Can I can I add it after or let me just see here? Yeah. Let me can I just type my website? Does it work is when it... you type comments? Uh, like website, does it work in the... I'm not sure. We're going to test it out. <laughs> so let me type in my website, www.mymarketability.com. And you click on events, you will see the sign up for the webinar there. The other thing I recommend for those who want to, I, I post a lot of free content. Oh, yes, perfect. Can you click on it? Um, is I recommend to also come connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm actually very active on LinkedIn and I share a lot of free content and advice on there. Um, I use Instagram more for behind the scenes of, of my business, but LinkedIn, I share tons of tips on there. So if you look me up by Diana YK Chan, you should be able to see me. I'm just typing to see if I could add that URL, Diana Chan in here. Okay. Well, Diana, yeah. Oh, someone pinned it. Did you pin that? Okay, that's my website there. I pinned that. So oh, then... okay. Yeah. Perfect. That's yeah, awesome. so that's where you can connect with me. Great. So I see a lot of this is your audience here, and, uh, you know, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, um, so for those of you who joined but missed the first half, <laughs> we had two videos. We talked quite a bit. Yeah. an hour and a bit <laughs> and found out that Instagram kicks us off after an hour. <laughs> but Diana, you gave such valuable information, everything from like layoffs and, you know, reentering the workforce to like confidence, which yeah. is a huge thing when it comes to job search, promotion, networking, yeah. the salary negotiation. That was a big one too. Yeah. And, and so um, so we have to, we do have to cut it off now. <laughs> we you, do. you do have to go. You do have to go and see I'm your I'm getting text messages kids. from my husband now. Can we come oh. in? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we got to go. But I really appreciate this. Your you're time welcome. is invaluable. You're, you're welcome. And so, yeah, so, so for up. anyone. 
yeah, yeah if I can maybe wrap, like for those who are here if um if you're you're also looking to get some like job search help uh, career coaching help feel free to just come on my website tons of free resources on there check it out um if you're interested in also getting some coaching feel free to book a consultation call with me as well I'm happy to have a conversation Need is also a great person to to reach out to like you know that you do a lot of that leadership career coaching for moms as well um, definitely worthwhile in having a conversation uh, with a coach because we were trained and also we are trained to also help you see things from a different perspective and to help guide you and hold you accountable as to help uh, reach your goals and stuff as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. My pleasure. Have a good <laughs> weekend. All right. You take care, Anita. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>